Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ian Campbell. I'm Vice President, President of Operations at PASIC, and I am the staff lead for the Risk Officers Forum, and I'm your moderator for this afternoon's broadcast. So welcome. Special welcome to people joining us here on the broadcast for the first time. It is Leap Day, uh, an extra day this year. I have a friend, I've known him 40 years, and he is turning 18 today, so a uh, very exciting day for him. Um, I want to thank my colleague, Danica Hall, who is joining us. Uh, she's behind the scenes and has set up the broadcast and will be troubleshooting throughout. So thank you, Danica, for that. And I just encourage everyone to sit back, relax, and enjoy the next 90 minutes of discussion. Today, we are looking, uh, it is, is dubbed a conversation with insurers regarding risk identification and risk assessment. We try to use this first webinar of the three that we're, we're operating in 2024 to map out risk issues, to give uh, people out there clues, tips, uh, tricks in terms of identifying risks and assessing them for their organization with a full year ahead of you. This is always a popular broadcast and I think it's our sixth year doing this now and uh, people really, really enjoy this. So we hope, hope you uh, enjoy today's broadcast. But Danique, if you could, there we are, our agenda. I'm gonna go through some housekeeping items. I'm going to introduce our panel. We're going to talk as we close the meeting, talk about our April 4th Risk Officers Forum meeting, and then I'll close. I'll talk about a satisfaction survey that you're going to receive tomorrow and, and hopefully give us good comments on today's broadcast. So in terms of our panel, we have three people that you've met on paper, and you're now going to meet them in person. So Michelle Falkins, uh, Vice President, Chief Risk Officer and Chief Financial Officer at Heartland Farm Mutual, Inc., Grant McEwen is Chief Risk Officer and Chief Financial Officer with Chubb Insurance Company of Canada. And Amir Romani is Chief Risk Officer with Gore Mutual Insurance Company. So welcome panelists. We have uh, given out questions or I've, I've given our panelists a series of questions that we're gonna work through in today's broadcast. And uh, we've got those divided up into a number of uh, popular subject areas. And um, in terms of housekeeping items, what do I need to I need to tell you that um, the, um, that we're doing we're offering this with MS Teams, as you know, and you see the taskbar on the top. So if you have a question, we certainly invite your questions and comments in real time. Just use the, the raise hand feature, and then you can turn on your camera, identify yourself, and uh, pose your question or comment. We want to make this very conversational. And if you don't want to do that, you can use the uh, chat box. And there's also the question and answer section as well. So Danica will be monitoring that. And we'll try to bring those up questions and comments as they occur throughout the broadcast. But uh, uh, certainly invite those questions in real time. And um, antitrust compliance apply, applies throughout the broadcast. The Competition Act is in effect. You are competitors throughout the broadcast. We're not scheming as an industry in this broadcast. Uh, just uh, that keeps our, our lawyers happy telling you about that. And um, the, re the meeting is being recorded. There's going to be an edited version of this, we hope, up on the website shortly. So do watch for that and advise your colleagues if uh, they aren't able to attend us in person today. Okay, so let's get on to our questions. Um, we started first with a working definition. We, we had a little chat uh, beforehand with the panelists and a good working definition. We've, we've done this in previous broadcasts on risk identification and risk assessment, where we map out what, it, what do we mean by emerging risk? And uh, for purposes of the questions you're gonna hear today, an emerging risk is an accelerating risk where the outcome or the implications are not known or clearly assessed and or where there's not appropriate ownership or classification of the risk. So you're primed now. Now we're going to get into our series of questions. So the first category, we looked at uh, risk identification tools and sources. And uh, I'm going to call on, on Michelle first and then Amir and Grant in turn. Uh, what risk identification tools do you use? How and from whom do you get risk information in your organization? Michelle, let's throw that to you. Thanks. Ian. Um, so I think most of this will be a surprise to any of you. Um, we're probably all using a lot of similar tools. So the first one that I use is I use our emerging risk spectrum, uh, and that allows us to identify any emerging risks, um, understand what impact they have, if they're a low impact or a high impact, and if they're more proximate or less proximate. So we identify those usually quarterly at our um, exec meetings and try to identify what's new risks, um, anything new, anything that 
which change in the spectrum. So that's how I get that information. Um, ORSA and ERM are also important tools as they allow me to identify our key risks and what the likelihood of those risks are along with their potential impact as well. I like that the ERM helps me to identify risk owners and helps to identify um, the controls that we have in place to mitigate those risks. So I find that tool really helpful. Um, I present my CRO report at our quarterly risk meetings um, with the board, um, and I highlight any new risks and provide any updates on existing risks that are there. And most of the information I receive um, for the CRO report, it comes from a couple of sources. Because we're a small company, I'm the CFO, the CRO, and the compliance officer. So I'm involved in pretty much all the meetings that go on in the company or a lot of the big meetings that go on in the company. So I really have my finger on the pulse. Our CEO, he's also, he used to be a, a risk officer, so he understands the importance of risk. So he makes sure that I'm brought into any discussions that are impactful for risk. So I usually am brought in right away to, to be there to advise, listen, gather information. And I would say the the other way I get the information is every quarter I send out a management rep letter to our exec team um, and they cover all of the departments and they send that information back to me where they're identifying any new risks that they're seeing in their area along with updates on existing risks that they had their last quarter. They identify whether they have any compliance or control gaps in that report as well. So those are the things that I use. Finally, I would say the last thing that I'm looking at is I use the FCT report um, just to see if if there's anything that would put our company at jeopardy. Your board is meeting on a quarterly basis? Is that a quarterly basis? Yep. That's correct. Okay. Let's throw it over to Amir. Thanks. Um, it's a pleasure speaking to everyone. And, and it's, a, it's a pleasure to be the first one to say, you know, I agree with what my previous panelists said. And, and uh, that was a great response. And I, I guess, uh, you know, for the for the easy answer to what tools do you use and who do you get information from, uh, you know, the the, the trite answer is all tools and from everyone. I mean, I really think that um, emerging risk needs to be incorporated into all the elements of the enterprise and the operational risk programs that we have. Um, and I don't like to have too hard a distinction between current and emerging risks. You know, when, when we think about the risks that present to the organization and when we're building the risk profile, we're thinking about the known known risks, you know, the current risk, those that we know the you know, we, we've identified the risk and we, we've identified the potential impact. But those emerging risks are those where we've, you know, we know the risks, but we don't know what the potential impact could be. It, there's, again, you mentioned uncertainty. So, you know, I, I really think we need to blend both the known known and the known unknowns into all elements of the enterprise risk program or, or risk having siloed views that, uh, prevent us from planning adequately, prevent us from really um, meeting the top risks of the organization. So, and I think that when you look at, at, at expectations of things like RCAs, that, you know, they're meant to be forward looking. You know, we, there's an expectation that you're looking not only at current risk, but at forward looking risks. So I would, I would, um, you know, echo everything that Michelle said. Maybe I would add one other tool, which is, um, uh, you know, a, a, a change risk assessment um, within the organization, uh, we call that a NIRAP, a, a new initiative risk assessment uh, program, where we talk about how the, how changes within the organization could change the risk profile of the organization. And we, we think, uh, we think forward as to what could happen. Um, and, you know, that 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 ultimately is is uh, how we put together and synthesize, uh, drawing from all these different programs, uh, what the risk profile of the organization looks like uh, for for knowns and unknowns. Susan Meltzer, when we first started this, was with Aviva and, and was a CRO at that time, and um, she had suggested we do this at the at the start of each year to to talk about the Black Swan. Uh, risks, the ones that right. they, I guess that would be the unknown unknown. Well, right? Is that so the, you look I, at that? the unknown unknowns, exactly right. And 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 I think you really have to tie that all in. Like when we talk about unknown unknowns, then you're talking about scenario analysis, and you're thinking, you know, you're trying to think 
uh, laterally ac uh, across events, and there's a different uh, view of how to mitigate those through more of a resilience lens. So, I, you know, it just has to be there. There, there are different methodologies, but it has to be all in the same pot. And I think all the same tools are really powerful in both. Uh, the, you know, all of those risks. So it's it's really just having a, a good, strong, robust framework that you can build on. And Grant, how about yourself? Tools and, and sources uh, identifying risks that may hit Chubb? What, what do you use? Yeah, great. <clears throat> Thank you, Ian. And also uh, really, really happy to be here. Um, not a, a whole lot different. Obviously, some of the you know tools we would use would be slightly different, but accomplishing the same thing. I'm, I'm the only panelist, I suppose, that benefits from a global entity outside of Canada. So I have a lot of resources. Um, not necessarily at my disposal, but certainly that I benefit from. Um, and, and similar idea, and I've, I've started thinking more and more of these risks, not so much as um, maybe emerging, but evolving. And so you think of the risks that would be at the top of your list, climate change, cyber, you know, they're they're out there, they're, they're known, as Amir points out, but they're evolving, and they're evolving quickly. And so not so much identifying the unknown risks, but how do you keep pace with the evolution of the risks that you already know about. And that that's a key, a key focal point of our group. And then, you know, one of the things we do, which I'm sure um, my colleagues here on the call do as well, but we we have a kind of a risk register, a litany of risks or of emerging risks. And we try and, and it's an ex, it's it's extensive. And um, and then on a quarterly basis, we would look at those risks and and see, you know, what is the direction of change? And are we more concerned about the risks, you know, than we were three months ago? Are we a little bit less concerned? Um, it's hard not to jump ahead into some of the other topics we have on the agenda, but uh, I'll, I'll maybe leave it at that, and then we can talk about you know mitigation and what we do about those risks once we identify that they're maybe moving um, up or down the spectrum. The second question was about um, emerging risks. That that what what should I know about, and and how do I how do I get familiar with these issues that are going to hit me like a brick in the head? What um, these successful companies out there, what what are you doing to identify an emerging risk? What uh, like you, you say, some are slow moving. You see the train coming down the track, but Amir, how do you what what tricks or tips do you have for flagging something that may be a big issue for your organization in a couple of years? Sure. Time? Well, I mean, uh, there there are, there are great resources out there. Um, you know, when I when I joined uh, Gore, I, I come from a non-insurance background in financial institutions. When I joined Gore, the thing that struck me was the the breadth of uh, disciplines that you could apply to the uh, view of risk in insurance. You know, you, you're, you're talking about uh, we mentioned climate change. There's you know earthquake risk. There are social, political, regulatory. There's the the macro view. Um, I, I recall that uh, PASIC actually had a, um, we had an event looking at sunspots and potential impacts of sunspots on, on you know, the earth um, and electromagnetic fields. So, you know, the, the, the range of disciplines uh, that you have to be interested and aware about and inquisitive about is really broad. And most, my, you know, the, the number one tip I'm going to give you is you have to build that that inquisitiveness, that um, that that risk awareness uh, within your risk culture. You have to be able to think about many diverse sources and you have to kind of think laterally and say, well, well, how can this apply to my situation? What does that mean from in terms of how I my my stakeholders, you know, how will this impact my stakeholders? How will this impact my um, the organization as a whole? So uh, obviously, I, I you know, I, I wouldn't be doing uh, anyone a service here if I didn't uh, plug PASIC as a, as a great source of um, content, but there are a number of other studies and surveys that uh, where they pull CROs or industries as the top risks. Um, uh, the, the Global Risk Institute, GRI, just released one. Then RIMS is uh, one that I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm a member of RIMS and, uh, and a big fan of the work they do. And the large consultancies all do the same. So that's going to provide you a good, uh, a, a good kind of sampling. From, an, from a tools perspective, a really robust 
uh, external risk event reporting program, I think is really important to understand what's happening in the industry. Uh, where do we see losses and how does this apply to me? Is this something I've considered? Um, and and not only just in our industries, but in, in, in overall industries, you know, when there's a liquidity issue in a U.S. bank, what does that mean, you know, in terms of the can Canadian context, the, the liquidity within from a banking perspective, do you have to think about concentration issues? Do you? So it's, it's really thinking through those. Um, there are services uh, out there that can help do that for you. Uh, I, there's a, a great company that I followed for a while called ORX. Um, and um, and then, you know, again, because it's so, such a such a multidisciplinary view, there are great specialized groups uh, and forms out where out there that that are helpful in understanding the technical aspects of 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 certain risks as well as what they're seeing from a trending perspective. So, um, from a cyber and tech perspective, uh, you know we're we're a member of uh, an organization called FS Isaac, which is a, a sharing center for cyber risk. But you know you you have to be um, you have to be a jack of many many trades and and be able to draw from expertise. Um, across multi uh, dimensions and sense of and kind of just put that together into a cohesive pictures and, and and that's really that's always been the challenge for ERM. It was futurist essentially. Uh, Grant, let's throw it over to you. How about what what uh, what do you do to those flying bricks that are going to hit you? What what do you do to to uh, see them coming? Yeah, I mean, I, my um, my notes are very similar to what Amir just mentioned. I, I completely agree. I think if you are a curious person and you love to read the news, then you know this role is is the role of a risk officer is is well suited to you. And it's just connecting the dots. I mean, I don't think anybody should really anybody on this call should really be sitting around in an empty room trying to think of what the next next asbestos is. Like, there's tons and tons of information out there. It's uh, it's it's finding it. It's being curious about it. It's connecting dots, and I agree. All the the major um, the accounting firms are great resources. The reinsurers are you know they've got real like think tank bodies. We get their reports. Um, they provide excellent risk analysis, emerging risk analysis. Um, like you mentioned, PASIC. I had that on my list. Um, World Economic Forum. I mean, there's just a you know the the amount of information out there is almost overwhelming, and if you you can certainly find your niche what what appeals to you and then i would say you know the other risk out there is this is the risk that you get fed uh your in your news and your information and then the algorithms start to feed you what you want to read so i would just say to people too like make sure you are going after the information yourself because you need all perspectives if you got one news feed you might think that you know the u.s election going one way could be the best thing ever and if it goes the other way it could be the worst thing ever kind of thing and you wouldn't know you wouldn't get both sides so you have to be curious you have to be out there on your uh, on your own investigating looking reading things finding the information a good very good point about that the uh, the stories you receive um and michelle how about yourself probably don't have much to add i had all of the same same items on my list as as everybody else so i i don't think i have anything further to add to that Okay, and let's. So now Ian, let's, Ian, sorry. Yep. The the one yeah, last absolutely. thing I would say is, um, these are great forums to get names and reach out and just build networks. Uh, as someone who came into the industry, I, 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 you know, it's been a very receptive group of CROs and risk professionals who have, um, been really willing to share information, and and I, I suggest everyone here uh, do that uh, because we're it, there's kind of that. Um, there is the kind of the same, we're, we're all rowing in the same directions for different companies, but ultimately we're, we're all concerned with, uh, the, the health of the industry and the, the health of our organizations. And I will share in the, in the follow-up note to all the members out there, your email addresses. So if people want to converse with you sidebar after the fact about something you've said or question or comment, they want to take up with you personally, that would be great. And it is very unique that we have such a highly competitive industry. Uh, 170 companies, something like that, competing, and we all get together and uh, um, and and talk openly about and share, give you a chance to look over the fence. And I think that's what is uh, popular about this session as well, that it lets you hear, how am I doing? I think I'm doing well, but how am I doing against this company or that company? And uh, it's it's very instructive. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question I'm going to start with, uh, let's go Grant, Michelle, and then Amir. So at your organization, how does strategic planning and risk management work together on the identif identification of emerging risks? How effectively are these working together to support strategic decisions in your organization? Grant, let's let's go to you on that. Great, thanks, Ian. I think I think we as risk officers of insurance companies, it's it's a very unique perspective because, of course, we're in the business of insuring against risk, and so I very much view my role um, as identifying the risks that could harm us as a business. And it's not to eliminate them; it's to identify them, mitigate them, bring them down to within acceptable tolerances for the business. Whereas on the business side of things, they might look at the exact same risk and they're looking as to how they can provide solutions to help other organizations mitigate those risks. So to me, it, it comes together a little bit in that, in that area whereby I'm advising or collaborating with frontline colleagues as to what I can consider to be a risk for Chubb, say earthquake exposure, whereas then they're also now underwriting or building a plan to provide protection for their customers. So I, I think it's this, this pathway we, we both walk, whereas I'm trying to protect the organization, but also support the business making decision through the strat plan. Um, and then the key for us, of course, is, you know, looking at what we consider to be these evolving risks, making sure that we have the adequate approach in the, in the strategy to not overly expose ourselves. If we view a particular area as being problematic or line of business as being problematic, making sure we have wording to protect us. These types of things would all go into that, that thought process. Okay. And Michelle, how about, how about you and your organization? Yeah. Um, so for us, the strategic planning, I'm sure with everybody else, it starts at the board level. So every year we have a board offsite, um, which thankfully I get invited to as the CFO. Um, so I'm firmly embedded in the strap plan. So typically what we'll do is we will identify some critical emerging risks um, and try to figure out how we can embed that into our corporate initiatives. So usually we try to turn those risks into something positive that will help us with our corporate initiatives over the next couple of years. Um, and then what we do is we'll roll that down to the organization. So it'll roll out to an executive in their goals um, and then they'll roll it down as appropriate in the organization. So I'll give you an example of one this year that we've identified. So broker consolidation is probably on everybody's list is, you know, a hot topic. So, so mm -hmm. we at the strat plan session our ceo he reviewed with the board how's this impacting heartland so you know providing a list of our brokers that are consolidating what's the volume with each of those brokers and then we turn that into something positive so now we have a strategy on how to mitigate that risk so you know it, it's a strange way because we're actually thinking about how do we get into into bed further with these companies? Not necessarily to mitigate it the other way, but how do we make ourselves as a mutual company indispensable to those companies so that they'll look to us when they're they're looking to grow? So that's now on all of the execs goals this year. So obviously it's led by the BD team, but we all have a part to play. So all of us have have a, a part to play in it. We meet quarterly. We talk about it with our teams um, today at our town hall. We'll be discussing it at our town hall with all of the employees and each of our employees will where appropriate in the department um, in the departments. They'll have a part to play as well. Okay. Great, very practical. And Amir, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, just I would echo um, uh, Michelle and Grant. I, I, I think when you look at um, strategic planning, you're talking about organizational change in many ways and and uh, kind of so having that um, that change uh, risk and control view um, is important. Um, and and then it's almost kind of have walking the 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 organization and the board almost through kind of a risk appetite as to what are we willing like what level of uncertainty are we willing to uh deal with in order to achieve those goals so um that you know that that and again it is just uh, embedding it within the overall uh methodologies of our of our risk framework the next question is kind of a loaded question it is um at your organization uh or, or sorry, do you see value in surveying internal employees and or external partners as part of your emerging risk identification process? I'm thinking yes. Uh, why or why not? And if yes, what <laughs> tools do you use to, to get a, conduct the survey 
and how frequently do you conduct this survey? So we've seen with our ERM, when I go to members every second year now, um, there's a lot more internal communication about risk issues, more and more. We see that from the board level, you're sharing it with frontline employees, and then you're actually uh, communicating with external partners. That's clearly, there's a, a trend that that's going on in, in all the companies out there, all the, the, uh, the big, big companies for sure. Um, so how's that being done in your organization in, in terms of um, sharing information internally and externally? And let's go Michelle, Amir, and then Grant on this one. So Michelle, how do you circulate uh, conversation yeah. on risk issues? So we, um, you know, we definitely promote a risk culture at Heartland um, for all of our employees across the organization. We don't send out a survey. So I think we're we're pretty small, so we don't have the resources to necessarily um, be surveying everybody. Um, I think our frontline line employees are good at identifying risks, but I think what they identify probably is more operational risk because they're kind of very far into the weeds. So they'll see the operational risks that face them every day. Um, so I think it's harder for them maybe to recognize what an emerging risk would be. But I think what we can do with that is if we see a pattern of, of risks that they are seeing on an operational front, this could result in an emerging risk if we see patterns um, emerging from that. So typically um, the leaders would then bring forward if they see something emerging from that, but we don't uh, we don't necessarily send out surveys. We just have, I think, a, an upward flow of information because we're a small company. Yeah, so perspective for everyone out there, um, the number of employees at, at Heartland would be approximately? So we have a vote. 130. Okay. Okay, let's go Amir. How many let's how many employees and then let's let's get into the question about your internal communication. Uh so Gore is is um you know just uh shy of 700 employees, six six something at this point. We've we've had quite a bit of growth in the last few years. Um so to to ask the uh, to answer the question, uh yes, I mean surveying internal employees uh at all levels of the organization, you know, I mean, that's when when you look at uh, what's the expectation of a mature risk framework. Uh, there's both that top down and bottom up flow of information and 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 understanding. Um, so so yes, you you. We strive to involve as many people through that process because you want a diversity of opinion at different layers to understand kind of um, the 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 a, a more accurate view of the risk profile of the organization um we do through we we do that through a number of tools within our um uh within the framework i mean we talked about a, a risk and control assessment and that's that's there's an expectation of that to be done at least annually but all the different programs that we have should feed back into updating and 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 um expanding on our understanding of of the risk profile so when we talk about risk event reporting when we talk about you know the metrics that we've set at different levels be they kris or or risk limits or uh we're looking to to build as much of a diversity of early warnings and and an update mechanism so that we know what's happening uh that we understand if things are shifting um we you know, I think promoting a risk aware culture is is going to be a, a is is a value add that ERM can can really provide to the organization and 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 doing so by really tying it into the organizational values, the organizational, you know, vision and mission. So not, you know, having a, a, a culture that is tied into those things so that you're you're promoting both at the same time um, within or one of the things that we've done is um, establish a risk champions network. So these are individuals that are selected at all levels of the organization throughout the organization um, to, again, champion that 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 concept of risk awareness to help to feed uh, risk events into uh, a centralized ERM view to help with metrics, to help with the RCA. Um, and but also to be there as advocates for um, the work that we want to do from a risk awareness perspective. Um, and it's it's through that network that we do a lot of our communications, though, though, obviously we we would do so um, independently. And then, you know, there's there's a lot of training that has to take place. There's a lot of awareness sessions that have to take place that we coordinate through 
you know, cybersecurity training, third party risk training. These are these are all things that we have to 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 do to have that dual flow of top down and and bottom up information. Um, and that includes kind of making sure that everyone understands the risk appetite throughout the organization and and have it you know get kind of translated in a way that they feel is, is that they can ingest and that 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 resonates with them. And again, uh, I would suggest tying it always back to the organizational values, to the goals of the organization, uh, so that they can, that's language that they understand, but uh, combining that risk uh, component. Grant, how, how big is Chubb? And how many employees? And, and what uh, internal communication at, at Chubb, how is, how is that, uh, how do you get information? Sure, thanks, Ian. So, um, so in Canada, we're about 700 employees. Globally, we're, I believe we're over 32, 33,000 now with um, uh, a recent acquisition. So a uh, huge organization. And the short answer is yes, we survey. Um, and so two key surveys, and I think they accomplish, in my view, um, you know, three key things. So we survey on a global level, we survey uh, uh, senior leadership. Um, people in senior positions, and I, I'm not exactly sure what the cutoff is, but um, but it goes out to you know a few thousand people, and and then locally we do again in Canada we do a very simple uh, survey Glo globally I should say we do that annually, uh, locally we are doing it uh, a couple times a year, and I think there's like I say there's three key takeaways in my mind I mean there's lots of takeaways but the three key ones I would flag are uh, number one you're looking for uh, trends you're looking for what it, what are on people's minds? What are they seeing out there? And we we lead the witness to a certain degree. So we will provide what we believe to be the the litany of risks out there, emerging risks, uh, current risks, evolving risks, and then ask people to rank them or to pick their top five. So we can really get a pulse on um, what we think are uh, sort of the critical top of mind type risks that we need to be thinking about. So that's one one key. Um, key objective, and the second thing that it accomplishes is, you know, the write-in option. So, what are what are you thinking about out there that we might not be thinking about? So, um, and again, these surveys going to operations, claims, underwriting, finance. So, you do get, you know, what might be top of mind to a finance person is not necessarily top of mind to a um, to a claims person. So, you want to get all that that knowledge. Um, so, we're trying to gather, you know, what we might not be aware of. Uh, and then the third thing is that sort of the reverse, where is whereby by putting out the survey and by putting out, you know, here are the things that we think are risks to the organization, uh, you inform. So now the people receiving the survey are like, well, I hadn't thought about that. And now they start to think about it. And it's all part of this embedding the risk culture in the organization and getting everybody thinking about the implications or the controls. Uh, over risks or what we could do as an organization. So I think that they're very valuable. Again, I'm 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 in the advantage of working for a large, sophisticated organization globally. Um, not to suggest that anybody isn't sophisticated, but we have a lot more people. Um, and so so we certainly do that on the global scale, and then we try and emulate something a little bit smaller on the Canadian scale for our team here. It's it's helpful knowing how many employees in your organizations because it gives a, a, a kind of an idea of scale. So. Next question, uh, Amir, Grant, and Michelle will go in that order. Um, tips you have for implementing an emerging risk identification process. So large organizations versus small organizations, how's that going to be different? What, what, um, uh, well, again, I, I, I'll go back to saying that I think it's just kind of fundamental to the components of the ERM framework and that as you're building out those frameworks, you have to consider both um, you know, the known knowns and the known unknowns and that you have to be forward looking at all times and you're trying to distill as much um, information from as many sources as possible to kind of provide you with with that view. Um, but for smaller organizations, you know, if, if we're talking about at the at a Mac uh, micro level, what can we do? I would focus on uh, risk event programs. Um, uh, you know, looking at external risk events, looking at external uh, loss data, um, uh, ex you know, research as much as possible, be inquisitive, uh, and scenario analysis, you know, you, you, taking some time to just um, get away from the administration of the program and really just engage your stakeholders in some good discussion and, and 
um, uh, foster that inquisitiveness internally and, and just ask questions and, you know, throw grenades and see, you know, what, what happens. And, and that helps both from an emerging risk perspective, but also to, to flesh out some of those unknown unknowns and, and, and help from that. And then secondly, again, if, if we're, if we're concerned around, um, you know, resources and, and we don't, we, we are all concerned about resources. We don't, we don't, no one has uh, enough to do everything they want to do. But starting uh, around a focus on critical functions, critical operations, and, and kind of thinking through that lens first of, um, you know, what what is at the core of what I'm trying to do, and then working out from that rather than starting at the periphery and, and, and having too wide a lens at the beginning. And then let's go grant um, in, in terms of uh, implementing a process for your organization. How, uh, what does that look like? Yeah, so it, we spoke a little bit about how you would source your risks or how you would try and, um, you know, scrape the news to determine what could be emerging risks. And I think that's the key component. And the, the real challenge, which I think we'll get into in a little bit as well, is how do you then take those risks and so what? So what could happen to us, to the organization, if one of those risks were to occur or one of those situations were to occur? And, and then that's where you need, I think, to be thinking about, well, what are the implications and how do I mitigate those? And, and for me personally, in, in a, again, as a subsidiary of a large organization, you know, we might have a corporate view on that risk and we might be willing to take a certain amount of exposure to a particular risk, but maybe that doesn't work locally. Uh, maybe our regulator would say, you're still taking on too much risk locally. Um, so we, we need to be thinking, or I need my, maybe the slight nuance here that I can add to the panel is, I can't just accept perhaps uh, a global view of a risk. I have to think about it locally and how would our regulator look at that? And are we doing what everything we need to be doing at a local level to mitigate that risk, to react to that risk, or to be prepared for that risk? Um, and again, similar tools you we have, uh, you know, thanks to our regulator, we have uh, uh, lots of required documentation that we need to do through um, ERMs and, and things of that nature. And we would rely on those and, and, and I'm not discounting the value in those. Obviously, it's it's the thought process that goes into them that uh, that helps you formulate uh, how you would react into particular risks. And I think I think Michelle mentioned it early on in the conversation. You know, we work we work very closely with our actuarial colleagues um, to make sure that we can uh, to some degree quantify uh, what what sort of those those scenarios could be. Michelle, how about yourself for implementing an emerging risk identification process at uh, at Heartland? Sure, how, how I'll just yeah, I'll just um, go on a little bit with what Amir said. I think um, the big thing is we all get bogged down in our day to day, so I think it's really important to set time aside at the beginning of each year. You know, set calendars to think about these risks because I think that's what's really important is to get the right group of people together um, at least quarterly to think about strategic risks and these emerging risks because otherwise you can just get sucked into your day to day and you just get so focused on what's in front of you that you forget to look at it more broadly. So I think you really need just some governance and structure and you just really need to make sure that you set that time aside to to do what's important. And just a reminder out there, if people have questions or comments you want to fire into our panelists, do that at any time. Put your hand up and uh, or use the chat box and, and join the conversation. I got a question from one of our viewers out there, Mary Kelly, uh, had said, uh, one way of identifying risks is to create a laundry list of risks and then examine how these risks will prevent or aid the firm in achieving its strat goals. Conversely, a firm could start with strategic goals and then for each goal, categorize the risks that will prevent or aid the firm in attaining those goals. Can you share your thoughts on the pros and cons of each approach? And is there an approach that your firm favors? Let's go Grant, Michelle, and Amir. What are your Great. thoughts, Grant? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we did, you did circulate this question in advance and I felt like I was uh, writing a university uh, a paper all over again. I think the the submitter is in fact with one of the, one of the major she universities is. in Canada. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I was initially thinking about it, I was like, oh, we do the former. We we very much create um, uh, a laundry list of risks, and then we sort of try and assess the implications of those risks or what we would need to do, again, to mitigate those risks, uh, how we would manage those risks, how they might yeah, prevent us from achieving a strategic goal if, 
you know, if you if you if you say hypothetically said, you know, we want to grow our property business in Vancouver. Well, OK, the risk person might come along and say, well, you realize that's in a in an earthquake zone and maybe that's not a strategy that we want to deploy. So very much those thought processes go through. And then when I was, uh, you know, lying awake last night, I thought, well, wait a minute, we do actually do the latter as well to a certain degree. Um, and I don't think it's an either or. So um, we certainly do look at, you know, what are the strategic goals that an organization might have um, and how can the risks we monitor, the risks we think about, um, uh, you know, interact with those strategic goals or aid those strategic goals from being achieved or what we might want to do from our strategic goals. So it's, I, I don't think necessarily, again, it needs to be one or the other. Um, I think we do elements of both. And, and again, you know, if the topic is purely emerging risks, you know, I don't put those in the category of saying, um, for instance, you know, are we, is our particular product going to be profitable next year? Um, you know, we do that as part of the finance planning process, um, looking at, um, you know, hurdle rates, returns of various products, making sure that we're comfortable with where we're at as a, as a strategy going into our annual planning. Um, it's, it's these it's the emerging risks or the sort of more macro risks um, that could affect the organization that we then have to layer in, I think, and say, well, based on what we're doing or what we want to do, are we are we missing anything that could derail us from achieving those if one of these emerging risks were to occur? And then we have that conversation uh, throughout the planning cycle. Michelle, for you, a, a CRO in a, in a smaller firm, you've got strat planning and you've got your laundry list of, of risk issues, which which one kind of leads and which is, which follows what or or do they both or do you see benefit in one over the other what what what's your approach sure i would say i'm i'm similar to grant i don't see a benefit in one or the other i think we do a little bit of both um i think sometimes if you get a laundry list of items you might get sucked into minutia and kind of not focus on maybe the strategic so i think you know we we probably look at our emerging risks I think would be more connected probably to our strategies. And we also would go the opposite way and look at what's the strategy for the organization and, and how does that combine with our emerging risk? So I like to give examples because it it makes me yeah. <laughs> think about it, I guess, more holistically. So one of the examples um, that I can give that, you know, was one of the risks that, that led to a strategic goal or sorry, probably the strategic goal that led to or accomplished one of our risks or helped one of our risks was um, our, our company goal is to achieve growth of 500 million by 2030. So that's that's what we want to achieve. So when we were doing that, obviously that's through m and So in 2021, we merged with a company in Nova Scotia, which allowed us to gain some scale there. But when we were looking at, at that um, merger, we're like, is it worth our while? It was a smaller company, is it worth our while? But when we were looking at also our emerging risks, geographic risk is one of our, was one of our emerging risks. So we're like, this is great from us, for us from a geographic perspective. So although it may not have been a company of the size we normally would want to merge with to get that scale right away, it was a company that we were able to spread our risk geography, geographically. So we thought it made a whole lot of sense. So that went in a big part of the decision-making process when we we decided to merge with with a, a company out west or out east. Very practical example. That's good. And Amir, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'll echo. We we do both. Uh, I think Michelle uh, brought up the 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 crux of um, you know the balancing act that you don't want anything um, that is so detailed that you're going to create a risk register that is pages and pages and and loses the reader. Um, you, you need to have something that's succinct, um, but at the same time, you know, is 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 comprehensive, and that's the challenge that we have. And and you know, we we maintain, and I'm sure everyone does here, uh, maintain taxonomies of risk that group like risk together, and that's where we start. You know, so rather than a laundry list, we we start at our taxonomies to help to guide thought through the risk identification process for current and emerging risks. The other the other um, call a tip I will I will give to the the viewers today is in terms of risk identification um, not only thinking about kind of the laundry list or or the the the, the specific items but um, I, I think it's really powerful to look at the controls 
almost separately. So the example I'll give you is that there are a number of industry standards and frameworks around cybersecurity and technology that have control domains linked with them. And even without looking at risk, you can kind of go to the control domain and say, okay, so this is the, the, the control expectation. What is the risk that that would logically tie to in the context of my, uh, of my organization? Like, and, and how prevalent would that be um, if we look at uh, other frameworks that are uh, around third parties around? I think that's a, that's, that's a useful tool to just make sure that you have a comprehensive view of everything that's out there by looking at actually the control and reverse engineering the risk from it. Great. Um, Mary had uh, another question, which is is interesting, and this time I'm going to go Michelle, Amir, and Grant in that order. Uh, how do you how do you ensure that you don't end up with groupthink in your risk identification process? So you're talking to like-minded people about emerging risks, and you start to get really insular. So what what are the safeguards that help you break out of that and and make sure that you're assessing all the risks that are out there? Otherwise, they're they're kind of saying the things people want to hear. What 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 are your safeguards? For sure. that's, yep. that's that's a good question. So I think we're at Harline, we're lucky that we have an exec team that has a, has a very good risk mindset to start with. So um, we've got our team's got a very diverse work experience and, and obviously educational background. So everyone brings a bit of a different perspective. Um, so, you know, on our exec team, we've got our CEO, CFO, BD, underwriting claims, IT and HR. So we're all trained in our relevant sections. So when we have, you know, when we start to think we're all, all thinking differently because everybody kind of thinks about their area and then. We also think about Heartland broadly. So I always find it interesting to sit back and, and listen and learn. So we have a lot of our exec team has been in insurance for a long time. So I think we have a lot to learn and I've got a lot to learn from them because they've been through cycles and different things. So it's great to hear their broad experience from a, an insurance perspective with their background. But we also have three of us from the support function that are relatively new to insurance. So I think we also bring a lot of value because we bring fresh eyes. So we're not tainted with, well, we did this before, or we've thought of this, or we thought of that. We can also bring fresh perspectives. Um, so I think it really allows for diversity of thought when you've got a, a wide group of people and not everybody from the same sector with the same backgrounds. I think at least two of our three panelists have CEOs right now that are, that were CROs, correct? Yes. 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 <laughs> it, actually, it actually makes blaming the other guy really difficult when you come in so right. in, in my situation um it was ceo and cfo were the two previous uh kind of heads of risk so i can never say oh that the previous person just left a mess that i have to clean up <laughs> and uh, so amir stay on that um your your safeguards core against groupthink what what uh... I mean, it's 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 an interesting question. It's something that we have to always be mindful of. But I would say that to a certain extent, you're the safeguard, right? As the CRO, you are the respectful dissent. You're the devil's advocate. You have to push for um, justification and internal consistency. And you're you're again, you're taking uh, as many threads of information as possible and matching them up and saying, well, does that is that consistent with what we are talking about? Or, you know, um, are the, do the metrics line up? Does the industry agree? Does the, um, you, as, as someone who is a professional in, in the, in the risk field, you are, um, part of the business, but you're expected to have that independent oversight. And it's, um, it's in having as much access to as many people as possible at all levels. And, and uh, within and, and without the organization, and, and again, just holding that up and saying, does it make sense? And uh, and really just pushing for that. And that, that that can be difficult because you are part of the team, but you have to be able to uh, maintain that, uh, again, that kind of respectful dissent uh, within a consultative uh, uh, view. And, and Grant, to close off on that question. Yeah, not a whole lot different. I would just say I think you can foster a culture of 
uh, open discussion, and it's not it's not a bad thing to be challenged on particular views. And if you state that at the outset, and I meet quarterly with our business, our our, our underwriting people, our ops people, our claims people, um, pretty much IT. Everybody that's ahead of a major group, I would meet with quarterly to discuss risk. And you know, one of the first things I say is, let's have a frank discussion about what you're seeing. We're not, we're not. We were here to, um, you know, uh, think about, ex- expose, um, you know, what could potentially be problematic. And it doesn't really doesn't do us any good to just kind of nod along with one another. Um, and surround yourself with colleagues. Like I have one colleague who's actually on the call um, that works with me on the risk uh, file. And uh, I hope he knows I encourage him to, you know, have those discussions, think critically, challenge. Uh, and then again, when you present to the board, I think all of us present to a board on the risks. Uh, make sure that the board knows that you're not, you know, you, you want them to agree, perhaps, but you also want them to challenge and discuss. A great segue into our next question, which is about uh, communication with the board. We're going to talk now of a different section of questions, pro- processes, strategies and approaches about uh, risk management. So. Um, when we do our ERM survey uh, of members, we we talk about internal t- communication and and it's really stratified. There's the board of directors, there's your senior management, there's the frontline staff, and then there's your your uh, external stakeholders. And and we're seeing a lot of absolutely everyone's talking to the board, lo- lots of communication with the board, less so maybe with the senior management, and not so much with internal employees. And and not many are talking to external stakeholders on sensitive issues like this, but. Um, for yourselves, how do you collect feedback from the board? So um, let's let's go Grant, Michelle, and Amir. So talk to talk to us about uh, your board meetings. How often are they meeting per year? And and what what's your interaction with the the board as as a CRO? All of your CROs, what um, what do you do to to make sure your issues are in front of the of the board and you're getting feedback from them on uh, um, top of mind issues that they should know about? Uh, Let's let's go then to to Grant on this. Thanks, Ian. Sure, I'll, I'll probably be brief. I'm in the unique situation, perhaps, on the panel where I have a single shareholder. So while I do have uh, a board and we meet quarterly and we have a risk committee, so I present to the risk committee and I present our risk registrar how we're doing against all of our stated risk tolerances, and then I would prevent give them a sense for emerging risks that we're tracking and how we're thinking about those. And again, like I just mentioned in the previous question. It's uh, it, it's a it's a it's a dialogue that I welcome, and we want to have open discussion. We don't want to necessarily bog the board meetings down, but we want the board to be informed. And we have a diverse board, and so we want them to uh, raise issues, raise questions, uh, have that dialogue either in the meeting or perhaps on a social uh, occasion afterwards. That's typically how we would handle it. Okay, and Michelle, let's let's go on to you on this. For sure, some step very similar to what what Grant said is we have our quarterly risk meetings this year. We've actually combined risk and audit together um, because we had so much overlap on those meetings and we had some people on one committee, some on another one, and we were re- found we were repeating a lot of things at both committee meetings. So now we've just got um, longer meetings that are covering covering both risk and audit. So we started that process in January of this year or sorry, actually this week. So we started that yep. this week. Your committee um, shadowing the board the same number of meetings if, if you're meeting quarterly or your committee's meeting quarterly as well? Quarterly, yeah. So we yep. have the board okay. meetings quarterly and the, the risk and audit meetings quarterly. So, you know, same same type of thing. We we stop, you know, stop through my presentation, allow challenge questions. I think what's been very helpful um, over the past couple of years, um, we've had quite a few of our directors start taking the ICD courses. So that's been helpful to get them to start thinking about questions, risk related, um, you know, being asking more, um, probably more intuitive questions um, and and trying to understand and or giving them a better understanding of what their role is. Um, we also have um, Mary, who's put the questions in, um, is on our board of directors. So she's been very helpful. She's an actuary um, by trade. And then she's also a risk professor, professor at Laurier. So she really helps a lot with the board to bring the board a risk mindset and ask a lot of really good questions at, at the board meetings and really starts to get the board to think more strategically about risk. So, so that's how we really engage with the board and, and get them to think differently. Great. And Amir, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, very similar experience to uh, Grant and, and Michelle and 
you know, given that this is recorded, I would be remiss in saying that we have a great board and and uh, they're uh, but no, but they're they're really a it's it's a it's a really professional board that that is um, uh, kind of multidisciplinary and brings so much experience and knowledge from from different facets. Um, I, I I think that you know we have a lot of one on one conversations as well as as um, kind of the overall board uh, meeting times and 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 uh, other in camera sessions. I think for me the the thing that uh, I make sure to do is not only talk about um, the the risks of the organization, but but really you know our fundamental responsibility or our fundamental role is to help the board meet their responsibilities around oversight uh, from a risk perspective over the internal control frameworks and and uh, it's really just gauging how well they you know what comfort do they have as to the visibility that they're having uh, is the you know is it at the right level do they have that comfort. Um, and just really digging into that and getting that feedback as often as possible. Somebody has, uh, Rolene has put a question in or a, a comment, a, a question in the chat. After using the laundry list of emerging risks issues, my firm uses the bubble chart to visualize emerging risks showing impact versus timeline and identifying actions, but also identifying opportunities. Uh, what your comments on that? Do you, is that something you employ as well in your organization? Let's go around the horn. Grant, Michelle, and Amir on that one. Yes, uh, we have a very similar tool that we uh, use at a global level. Um, so the chief risk officer for for Chubb Global, um, she she maintains that list, and then I would take that and kind of layer in again what I would see in the Canadian market. Some of the some of the risks we might see globally might not pertain as much to the Canadian market, um, and then and then we do something somewhat similar for Canada, uh, like I described previously. Michelle? Yes, we use a similar approach. I really don't have anything further to add. Okay, and Amir, bubble chart, you're using that as well? Uh, not so much a bubble chart. I mean, I, I'm assuming that uh, the question is around kind of mapping out the risk around a, a heat map. And, and um, I like that there are benefits of having the bubbles represent uncertainty around the assessment, and, um, and that's fair. Um, I just... I would rather just kind of hammer in at the assessment and try and get as much objectivity in there as possible. Next one, uh, talking about processes, strategies, and uh, and approaches is how does responsibility for identification of emerging risks get split out in your organization between the business, the first line, and the risk management function, the second line? So Michelle, Amir, and Grant, how does your how does the responsibility for identification of emerging risks in your organization get split out between the first line and second line? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about this already. Um, mm -hmm. We, you know, we raise, we're a small company, so we do raise risks. We talk about them weekly at our exec meeting, and then once a quarter, we'll, we'll talk about the emerging risks. So we just, we have a culture of, um, you know, a risk culture, so everybody's comfortable talking about risks. So I would say when we talk about emerging risks, Everybody has a say. We all, you know, brainstorm ideas, discuss where we want things to land on the on the spectrum. But then ultimately, in the end, it's my decision what makes it to the spectrum and what doesn't and where it goes on the spectrum. But obviously, I listen to feedback from from the team to understand, you know, what their thought process is. And I'll probe and ask questions. Um, and we have a just a, generally a great discussion. So it's probably I think it's everybody's favorite exec meeting <laughs> every quarter because I think everybody just likes it because it gets us to think outside the box and, you know, and kind of get away from the minutia of, of the daily grind. So I think it's it's one of everybody's favorite meetings and everybody leads with a high level of energy i think mirror how about splitting out great, first yeah. line second line in your organization well again i think um you know if we if we embed emerging risks as within the context of our framework it just follows that governance right it, it it's it's um the 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 roles of the lines are are pretty well established you know we we are there to maintain the framework to drive the consistency and completeness of uh, of the view to challenge, um, and the first line ultimately, you know, is is owns the risk, and and we we are there to assist them and and be consultative and to kind of again um, uh, 
to, to challenge wherever possible and have that oversight. So uh, that's another advantage of just kind of embedding it within the framework itself is that the governance just follows naturally. Uh, okay, the, the next question, or did, did we get Grant on that? No. Didn't get did me? Get, but... <laughs> I'm sorry. Yep, my, Happy my, to offer. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. I mean, nothing nothing really uh, overly unique. I think that I, I think the risk function, uh, I would go to the frontline function with some of these sort of macro risk concepts, be it climate change or geopolitical conflict and what the implications could be and get get some feedback as to what the business lines might think, how those could impact their books. Um, or their strategies. Uh, but then I'm also looking from the front line from underwriters claims, you know, what are you seeing that are you seeing an uptick in plastics in plastics claim? Or are you seeing anything? Is anything trending that I'm not aware of? So it's it, again, it's just depending on the type of risk, I think it's a two way communication. Some ideas come from the front line, some are come from the second line, um, depending on what we're doing. Okay. Next question, let's go Grant, Michelle, and Amir. How can companies quantify the impacts of emerging risks such as cyber, pandemic, and, and terrorism? And so some of these, like Grant, you, you said earlier, they're not so much emerging as they're, they're here now, but they're just evolving a little bit more than they, <laughs> every year is a, a little bit different. Um, so how do you go about quantifying the risks such as uh, cyber, pandemic, and, and terrorism? Yeah, so I, I think this is actually, one of the most interesting questions we have to cover today, because this really is the crux of the issue: is you you identify a risk, but you know, so what? So what is it? What does it mean to our organization? And I mean, I started out as I'm an accountant by education, and uh, that's most of my job, I would say. Um, so the quantification of the risks becomes very integral to how we think about what the consequences are, and ultimately. You know, almost all risks to a certain degree come down to money, now, setting aside this reputational damage, but even reputational damage ultimately translates into monetary damage. Um, so it, it's and it's very challenging. I mean, I, I couldn't honestly tell you that I would, as one board member always used to remind me, um, you know, all models are wrong. Some are useful. And so, you know, you want to have some sense or some model as to what could be the implications of the various risks you're tracking, the emerging risks you're tracking. And you mentioned, you know, probably a handful of the big five um, in terms of cyber, uh, geopolitics, I would say, um, uh, climate. And so, you know, what do those mean? But you have to take some type of a, a crack at quantifying through a model or looking at your exposures or what you're currently doing. And then it then it becomes a number, and it really at the end of the day doesn't really boil. It doesn't really matter if, uh, you know, if it's a a wildfire versus an earthquake versus whatever it is. It's ultimately a monetary damage, and then what have you got in place in terms of limits, exposures, concentration exposure, reinsurance purchases? How are you mitigating the risks once you have a number in mind? And you hope hopefully the number is not so high that you're not mitigating it, or you probably need to rethink your your strategies. Michelle, how about yourself? Oh, yeah, I think you're Sorry, I was muted. muted. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying yeah. to unmute myself. Um, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I, I agree with what Grant said. I think it's in order to quantify these risks. I mean, I think it's important that you look at a multitude of scenarios. So I think there's like so many different scenarios of a cyber attack. Like it's not just one thing that can happen. There's so many different things that can happen. And the same with terrorism attacks, right? It's not just one, one form of attack. So I think one way that you could do this is to have your AA, your AA um, include this as part of the FCT scenario analysis would be one way that companies could do that because they're obviously trained at quantifying these types of risks. So I would say that would be one method for you know a smaller company to, to do that. Namir, quantifying so, those. Yeah, I mean, quantification of non-financial risk is always going to be a challenge um, to the organization. I, I just to to really narrow the focus. If you're talking about cyber, there's a a, a few interesting methodologies that you can um, tackle the problem with. There's something called uh, the FAIR model, F A I R model, which you know it's an organizational investment that you have to do. And then there are other uh, external sources that will come in and uh, actually do scans um, and and use their models to provide a, an exposure calculation of of um, that's more objective that's more calculated. And then for non-financial 
you know, risks. Um, there, there are other resources and solutions, some of them quite practical and, and economic, ec economical that uh, can guide the organization in uh, running different kinds of simulations for risks, even with very limited data sets. I think the most important thing to remember is that sometimes you just have to start somewhere and just put a, a line in the sand and it's about refining the approach uh, more about being right the first time because you know you're not going to be you're not through a subjective view you, you you always are going through the process of refining and again shooting for internal consistency and making sure that you're bringing all of these different threads to to inform the decision I'm going to skip a question and we're going to go back to Amir Grant and Michelle on this. So what advice would you give risk managers in identifying the root causes of a risk rather than confusing them with symptoms of a risk? So causes versus symptoms of a risk. What, what's your guidance and are, are there questions one can ask when faced with this conundrum? So I'll say that, and you know, going back to, to Grant's comment in terms of reputational impact, I think there's a lot more sometimes confusion as to impact versus risk. Um, you know, when we say, you know, when we say that's a big reputational risk, well, you know, reputation for me is an impact. It's not a risk by itself. It's something that arises because something else has happened. You've had an operational failure. You've had a, a cyber event. So making sure that you understand the distinction between impact and risk is important. I think it's important to consider things that, that I'd call uh, not only I, but everyone calls transverse risk. So risks that really work to heighten existing risk within the organization. Um, so when we say, well, that's a climate risk or a climate change risk. Well, yes, it's a, it's it's brought about by climate change, but it's going to be touching different uh, existing risks within the organization, be they, you know, investment market risk or, or physical risk or so. So being very clear on that, and then if we're talking about symptoms versus kind of risk, then it's really having a discipline of root cause analysis and using tools like, um, you know, uh, five whys or the risk bow tie to say, to map that out so that ultimately you're, you're, you're kind of, you're mapping it out and finding that right balance between, you know, the, the hyper detailed symptom and the very broad taxonomy, uh, you know, chapter uh, finding the, the that sweet spot where you're 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 um, communicating the risk in a meaningful way. Okay, and I saw Deniki, you had your hand up, and I saw that there was a question in the in the Q and A, and we'll come to that. So thanks very much for flagging that. Let's uh, continue with this question over to Grant. Uh, uh, thanks, Ian. So I think the causes versus symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I think for me, um, the cause of the risk. Not to be flippant, not not to say it's not relevant. I think you have to understand where the causes come from, and and if they're if they're an internal, if you're creating a risk internally, then I think so the root cause. Then you can address it. And you should address it. You should fix that that issue. But if it's an if an if it if it's an external kind of cause, um, then I tend more to focus on well, what are the implications? And you know, if if I can't, my organization can't control the risk happening. I, I you know, I can't control an earthquake, um, but I can certainly control how we, how, uh, you know, how that earthquake might impact uh, the organization. Um, so I, I tend to sort of think of it in, in that sense to a certain degree. I don't get too, too bogged down in, in the root causes, like I say, unless I think they're something that we could, that we could affect or control or mitigate at the root level. Michelle, to close off this question. Yeah, I think I don't really have anything further to add. I think everybody's hit the points that I had, had wanted to talk about. Great. Okay, so Randy, you has a question here. Are there any emerging risks in the insurance industry that we can capitalize on if viewed holistically? Who wants to take a stab at that one? Well, I mean, uh, there are emerging risks that we tend to insure for. I mean, we, we have cyber insurance because we there's a lot of uncertainty in that space and, and we don't necessarily want to self, uh, so we don't capitalize, we, we don't self-insure, we, we look to external partner, partners. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you, I, I guess the question becomes, if you have a, a good enough view of what the impact of the organization can be, 
um, then by all means you should have uh, you know possible reserves against it um, to to address it. Others comment on that or yep. Yeah, I mean I I think if I if I'm um, like I mean you said I think the cyber springs to mind if I'm understanding the question, um, you know what what risks are out there not just to an insurance company but generally to say business functioning in Canada. Um, that are emerging. It would be on our. It would be on our list as an organization that we would want to protect against, like cyber. Um, and but but because we're in the unique position of being an insurance provider, could we provide coverage? And so you know, I, I don't know of any that we haven't really. You know, some companies or most companies aren't addressing. I mean, I think flood insurance didn't exist really in Canada, not that long ago. And then uh, people started to figure out where they could perhaps write flood profitably. Um, the recovery event was probably a catalyst, and now we have solutions in place, um, by and large, for for a lot of a lot of Canadians. So, you know, I, I think the 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 market gets there as as these things emerge. I I don't know of one. You know, if you're asking for a specific one that we could do right tomorrow, I don't really have one. But but I think we figure it out eventually. Well, and I'm sorry for for cutting in, uh, and I'm sure we want to hear from Michelle. But you know, if if we think of this. Um, you know, there's a balance again because I'm thinking of say if you're seeing a, a, an emerging macro risk that could have an impact to kind of credit worthiness or kind of different uh, impacts to different um, insurance behaviors or you know there there you do have to plan for it to a certain extent but to capitalize I mean capitalize is a is a big decision I mean you're tying up capital that could otherwise be served. And if you're doing so because you have, um, uh, you know, a, a, a good thinking of the, the the cause and effect, then you should definitely capitalize. I mean, it's something that's going to happen. So it, it really depends as to, uh, you know, and, and if you're at that point, you know, is it really a, a, a known unknown or is it uh, more of a known known and does it straddle that? So as an organization, you have to be comfortable talking about your appetite of uncertainty versus where you're tying up your capital. Michelle, did you have a, did we go to you a, a comment on uh, causes versus symptoms? Yeah, I think, um, yes, I think we already did. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the design, this is another question we've received from Mary. The design of the minimum capital test provides a framework for insurers to categorize risks that may impact the firm. How do you ensure that you capture risks that are outside the MCT framework? So Michelle, uh, sorry, Michelle Amir and Grant, let's go around the, the circle like that. Sure. Capturing risks yeah, outside I, the MCT framework. I think the best way to do this is to, you know, seek input from others in the organization. I think a lot of people don't know what's in the MCT framework, so we're deeply involved in it in the risk and finance functions, but other people in the organization may not be fully aware of what's in the MCT framework. So I think naturally by gaining feedback from others in the organization, you're not boxing yourself in necessarily. I do think it is hard to determine what's not in the MCT framework because a lot of our risks tend to be operational risks. Um, you know, you, you get into these risks and you think, oh, it's not in MCT, but then you can look at it again and say, no, maybe it is an operational risk. So I think that's also hard to determine like what's really outside of the MCT framework. Um, but I do think it's good and important to, to get information from others that may not be always thinking about MCT wouldn't be top of mind for them. Okay. Amir, let's, let's go to you next. Um, yeah, I, I mean, when I think of, and it, it, this kind of ties back into the, 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 the previous question is like the MCT is basically us capitalizing on uncertainties for the, for the future, right. In, in terms of certain large risks, um, I, I, I'm, I would say that it does so in a very blunt way and it doesn't really, and it does so in a very generic way. I mean, that's the, that's the, the purpose of it. It, 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 it's very prescriptive and it's formulaic and it doesn't really, um, it, it's the same for everybody. Um, I think the ORSA, which is, you know, an expectation of us having to go and, and look at the organization in a more tailored way from a capital perspective, um, starts to fill that, that gap of saying, you know, what are the, what are the risks and the factors that are more relevant to, 
uh, your organization versus to the, the regulatory capital requirements outlined in the MCT. Um, and the ORSA process, again, is the is the culmination of the ERM framework and putting in all that work throughout the year so that you have something that uh, the outputs of which better matches the organization's needs. Brent? Yeah, I, you know, I think of the MCT as, as really capturing balance, your current balance sheet risk. I mean, if you, if, you know, the, the model is based off of you know your insurance risk your credit risk your investment risk then they have a catch-all for operational risk but it's all what exists really on your balance sheet today um and so i think if you want to look at items uh, that are not captured by the mct you know i i think i think the uh, financial condition test is is a is a good tool to use because there you can scenario model for things that aren't in existence today but could plausibly happen or you could see happen um, and then you can run an outcome against your capital and see what the effect would be. So that's probably the tool I would use. And then, um, you know, you can you can layer on uh, any particular scenario you want into an MCT calculation as well if it were to occur. And we certainly do that. If we're stress testing, for instance, for a dividend payment or anything along those lines, we might come up with a scenario um, that's that's not necessarily going to occur tomorrow. But, you know, interest rate interest rates go up 100 basis points, um, you know, not unrealistic and see how that looks before we make any major decisions. This next question is more applicable to Amir and uh, Michelle. So I'll, let's go to Amir and then Michelle on this one. Uh, does inventory analysis have a place in insurance risk assessments? And if so, are there some caveats to this risk identification tool? So do you find use in uh, inventory analysis? Let's go Amir, sorry. Oh, um, uh, it it's not a tool that we've used, um, uh, you know, uh, very much at Gore. Um, uh, you know, I think there there's a use for every tool within the toolbox, and, and it's really dependent. But um, I I personally, it's not personally something that that I've used uh, extensively. And, and Michelle. Yeah, I would be in the same boat. I think I think it can be useful in certain situations. I think if it's a single event. It helps you kind of assess the path of probability for outcomes, but I think insurance, there's so many facets to the risk. I think there's different tools that can be used. So I think it's not something that we use either. Okay. Let's go on to a, another category, which is specific risks. And the first one is kind of a good segue into our risk officers forum meeting that's coming up on April 4th, and I'll talk about the speakers later on. But Fire, cyber, and regulation are significant risk issues already facing the industry. Although they're present and currently being dealt with, the quick evolving pace in which each of these areas may qualify them as emerging. Do you share this perspective and how are you addressing the uncertainty within each of these risks? And I can think of government regulation. So we have um, OSPI coming in to speak as the keynote speaker on April 4th, talking about government regulation and the very first discussion block after that, I'll talk more about this later on, is um, is an analysis of all the government the layers of government regulation facing the industry. So it's not it's not new in that government reg regulation always makes a list. It's a concern. It's a risk issue. But it's when when it's more active, it gets uh, it becomes an emerging risk for some in in some people's eyes. So um, what are your thoughts on that? And let's go, uh, Michelle, Amir, and Grant in that order. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Um, for sure, for us, this is both a current risk as well as an emerging risk, and both of these risks are in the very highest, almost off our, <laughs> off of our, uh, our register really? there yeah. on the on the top right quadrant. So, so we are looking at these risks currently today, and how do we assess them? So it's a it's a good question. I think. We're trying to learn as much as we can. So I think we're trying to divide and conquer again. We're a small company. So, for example, like IT would obviously take the lead on cybersecurity risks, but they're only accountable to some degree, right? They can make us secure from an infrastructure perspective, a firewall perspective, but we also have an employee, you know, our employees put us at the biggest risk from a cyber perspective. So it's all of our responsibilities to ensure that our employees are properly trained. Um, you know, we we do phishing tests. And if the employees of ours fail, then it's a leader's accountability to talk to them about it and to walk them through, you know, how can you improve the next time? What should you look for? So, so 
it's everybody's accountability. I guess there's so much to dive into. I think you can't just push things to one person. The same would be true for all the governance that's coming out with OSPI. It's coming from every which way. We don't have a big team of, of compliance people. You know, I'm it and Louise it as a CEO. So the two of us are dividing and conquering and we divide those out to others if we can. So it's really for us, it's get together, talk about it, divide out, try to get everybody involved because it's it's everybody's accountability in the end. And Amir? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll go back to, uh, I think the, the the main theme I've tried to put down is that uh, when you when you look at the known and, and, and known knowns and known, known unknowns together, that it's very helpful because you're kind of just building that assessment uh, together. Um, you know, we we look at them, you, you do what you can with the information that you have in place and um, where there is you know, a, a uncertainty in terms of the um, potential impact that prevents you from uh, putting together uh, any sort of mitigation, then that's where having um, uh, kind of reporting and, and, and monitoring is important to say, like, does it, does it meet a threshold that I've set where at this point now, you know, there's a watershed moment that I have to, to reassess and to, to look at things again. Uh, we have risks that are on a very long timeline. Um, breaking it down into, again, kind of uh, a lot of those are transverse risk and, and breaking it down into understanding what it does to the to the root risks and having thresholds to say, you know, uh, how does how does climate change impact uh, concentration risk? How does it impact um, uh, reinsurance? How does it impact all these different components and and just layering in a monitoring and and thresholding uh, view to that uh, to kind of to that uh, risk. Okay, and Grant, how about yourself? Emerging, uh, evolving risk. How do you how do you gauge that? Yeah, so we we very much would have like fire the fire the wildfire risk. I I would kind of bucket with climate change because. It's, I mean, it's a risk that exists today, but it's the frequency of the risk that seems to be changing. It seems to be uh, causing uh, more issues. It, it's happening more frequently. You look at the happening more severely. Look at Kelowna, um, and so certainly that's uh, that's on our uh, list. And and how we mitigate those as an underwriting organization. Um, cyber, another, and cyber, and not just cyber, but now you have AI, you have uh, deep fakes, you've got all these. These sort of um, we we tend to split them out a little bit, but they're all kind of in a general category. And how do we protect ourselves against those? Uh, so very much evolving, emerging risks in our list. Regulatory. I mean, I know we all love to grumble about our regulator, um, but it, it's you know it's it's somewhat our lot in life. And uh, yes, they have a lot. Of, they're, they're expanding their their the regulation. They seem to be moving away from not just prudential but some other things, and uh, and it's going to keep us busy. Uh, I don't necessarily view it, you know, as an existential threat to our organization. I think it's something that we have to, you know, deal with, and and that's just, you know, what we're going to have to do. So I don't really have that one high on my list of emerging risks per se. I know people love to to make that complaint, but um, but I don't have it there. Okay, and I see. Thanks a lot, Denise. Is flagged for me um, in in the chat. And uh, thanks, Ken. Will came up with a, a question here. How do you consider the impact of artificial intelligence for an insurance industry? Risk versus opportunity. And how would you comment what, what would be your company's preparedness in cons considering this as an emerging risk discussion and its quantification? So AI, um, risk or opportunity? Let's go, let's go Grant and Michelle and Amir. Grant? Yeah, I mean, I'll take the easy answer and say it's both. Um, you know, and and let's 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 be. I'm not sure I'm really qualified to talk about AI, but I, I would just say that you can see a world where, uh, you know, an individual could say, you know, write an insurance policy for me for this particular risk, and boom, AI could spit out an insurance policy. So it seems to me like there's a lot of risks to carriers from competition or from, um, you know, I know insure tech is a bit of a buzzword, but organizations that could figure out a better way to do things using AI than your organization could. So from there, it's a risk. Um, it, but I would also say it's an opportunity. You know, Chubb actually has a chat GPT that is being developed. So can we, an internal one, so can we use that to our advantage? You know, potentially. So um, it, to me, it's both, and it's uh, it's going to be real interesting to watch how this progresses. 
Ms. Hill, let's go to you next. And I mean, I agree with Grant. It's it's can be a bit of both, right? Um, we're also looking at it, you know, more from a claims perspective. How do we use that to be able to input basic things in our claims system, you know, without having to touch it? So, so I say it's probably a little bit of both. I'm worried about that, you know, as well. If we use that, how does that impact us? You know, what implications does it have? Are the right controls in place? So, even though we're looking at using it, it also worries me from you know, making sure we have the right controls in place before we go live with a with a product like this and internally. And Amir. So um I, I'm 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 gonna be the person who's a stickler on words because you know AI in the insurance industry has been uh, like AI has been here for a while. I mean we've we've used machine learning, we've used different forms of AI for quite a while. Um but what I think what the question is around gen AI and and the different and i think it's important to make a difference because we kind of lump it all as the same and, and i think it's it's a different uh call it risk or opportunity profile um but so like like uh grant like michelle yes i mean there's there's both um but this is another kind of what i call a transverse risk where it it's really it's less about the risk of AI to me, but how it impacts my existing risks. So if I've got a fraud risk, how will this impact, um, you know, fraud and the opportunity of people to fraud? If I have a cyber risk, how will this impact the opportunity of, um, uh, 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 of external malicious actors of writing code quicker and, 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 targeting phishing campaigns and so it's it's more it's less about thinking about ai risk and thinking about how does ai impact the existing risk I have to the organization and then the flip side of that is to say what are the opportunities what are the use cases that are present there so from a cyber perspective from a tech perspective well can i now write code quicker um the 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 uh, you know, and and then there's there's the exist like what does this do to my data governance? Like if I do not like who owns this information? Does it go to an external source from a you know, I don't want to be the next um uh was it Motorola or or that 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 had information out in Chad GPT and it's now in a public domain. I I don't want to have hallucinations causing incorrect uh incorrect uh decisions. So you know, it's it's more about looking at the individual risks and how they can impact, and then you looking at the individual use cases and controls and how they can bolster. We got just a couple more minutes. I want to respect people's time commitment here, so let's go around the horn really quickly. Just your top three risk issues. Now let's go, uh, Grant, Michelle, and Amir. The the is the risk issues that that are totally on your plate right now, just the top of mind, three risk issues that if you had to advise people out there, watch out for the following, what would they be? Well, I would say on our list, the top three emerging risks, I mean, we have climate change just because of its broad implications to the insurance industry. Uh, we've moved geopolitical risk up, you know, hard to draw a direct line necessarily to Canada, but I'm just concerned that the world seems to be, I mean, the world's always in a bit of rough shape, but but you've got two major conflicts going on right now and the and the can, potential contagion effect. We want to be thinking about that. And then the one we just mentioned, sort of cyber is is up there uh, in terms of, you know, we I think we are. I mean, I think we're hacked. We're, we, I think they had, people attempt to hack Chubb like multiple times a day. So it's just how good are your firewalls? Like you will get hacked if you're not paying attention. So you need to have the appropriate controls and and in place to to, to prevent that. So. Our top three, I would, yeah, cyber, um, talent retention is another big one for us, and regulatory, regulatory changes would be the other one. Okay, and Amir. Wow, it's like it's like your favorite movies. It's hard to to kind of narrow it down to the top three. Name your favorite children. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, uh, climate change, again, it's, it is such a, a transverse risk that impacts so many different pieces of the organization. That's definitely there for us. Um, uh, it, I, I think that cyber is and technology is, is also there. No one is ever going to be uh, wrong saying that they've got a problem with cyber uh, risk. Um, and then I, I, I would say that there's kind of a, I'll call it a, 
a, a three-way tie between uh, regulatory uh, impacts and, and rising expectations that we have to um, to address. Um, just the, the overall macro, uh, you know, uh, impacts to the economy coming up and, and potential uncertainty there, um, as well as talent. I think those are those are all things that, as an organization, uh, you know, the shift of of like the the market and and where we are continues to shift there. Great point to wrap up discussion, and I see we kept most of our registrants online throughout the broadcast. So thanks everyone for for continuing to stay on, and and thank you to our panelists, Michelle Falcon Falklands from uh, Heartland and Grant McEwen from um, and Amir Romani from Gore. Uh, so let's Denik has put up. This is the yes. Oh, sorry, there's our panelists, of course. But let's go for the Risk Officers Forum coming up on April 4th. Uh, Jackie Friedland is going to be talking about current industry issues as our keynote speaker. Then we're going to be talking about adapting to a regulatory, a rapidly evolving regulatory environment. Stu Carruthers from Steichman prepared in, I think it was 2015, he did a big flowchart diagram about all the government regulation out there, layers of government regulation. He's developed a new chart and it's like wall sized and it's going to be sent out to the industry just before this meeting. And he's telling everyone, put it up in your photocopy room. It is like something to just stare and gaze at. And, and they're going to be going through this in, in detail. He's going to be the moderator. And Sonia Kundi from Zurich, Tracy Mann from Definity, and Kathleen Thomas from Travelers are going to be the panelists for that discussion. And then we're going to talk about peril stacking and model risk. And so when you have two risks uh, immediately following each other, Glenn McGillivray and uh, his colleague from ICLR, Keith Porter, are going to be on hand for that. So. Again, thank you to our panelists. Um, a good point to wrap up discussion. Our satisfaction survey is going to be sent to you tomorrow. We really hope you enjoyed the broadcast and uh, can be part of our meeting on April 4th. Uh, do send us your, your feedback on today's broadcast. We're interested in enhancing future broadcasts. We always want ideas for upcoming topics and speakers, so um, we certainly value your, your feedback there. Thanks for joining us today. This concludes our meeting. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on April 4th. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe, and we will talk to you soon. And thanks for tuning in. Take care.